I'm sure Paul Stewart is the malevolent and short-fused Mr. Kellerson haunted the dreams of many boys who saw this film at a tender age. He is the big bad wolf in a rumpled suit and cheap fedora. For Stewart, the window was an unexpected professional rebirth. He'd come to Hollywood in 1940 with his colleague and good friend Orson Welles, having been a charter member of Welles' legendary Mercury Theater of the Air. He appeared in a few character parts, most notably Citizen Kane, but Stewart's true ambition was to direct. After several rugs had been pulled out from under him at both RKO and Paramount, including the promise to direct Joan Fontaine in a picture he'd developed called Christabel Kane, Stewart kissed off the movies and returned to New York, determined to direct, whether it was in radio or on stage. When production of The Window hit the Big Apple in early 1947, the only part not cast was the villain, which fit Stewart to a T. He signed on, figuring it would be a nice one-shot payday. Although the film wouldn't be released for another two years, producers in L.A. saw private screenings of The Window, and Stewart was suddenly in demand. He returned to Hollywood with his wife, singer Peg LaCentra, and worked steadily as a character actor all the way into the 1980s. To me, Paul Stewart, born Paul Sternberg in Manhattan in 1908, had one of the most distinctive faces and voices in the movies, especially well-suited to film noir. Ted Tetzlaff, the director of The Window, was born into show business. His father, Teddy Tetzlaff, was a famous race car driver who'd become one of the leading stunt drivers in early Hollywood. Ted Jr. became a cameraman during the silent era and photographed more than 100 features over the course of almost 20 years, including such classics as My Man Godfrey, Talk of the Town, and The More the Merrier. His last job as a DP was the 1946 Alfred Hitchcock thriller Notorious, where he obviously gleaned tips from the master of suspense before embarking on his own directorial career. As for Bobby Driscoll's career, he once remarked that they carried me in on a satin cushion and then dumped me in the trash. After the window, he had one more hit, Treasure Island, in 1950. But after that, it was a sad spiral into adolescence. Puberty put an end to his cherubic appeal. In his teens, Driscoll suffered severe acne. And only six years after headlining Song of the South in 1946, he couldn't get a job in pictures. By the time he was 17, he was spending all the money he'd made feeding a heroin addiction. Driscoll moved to New York in the late 50s and started bartering his one-time fame for gigs in the burgeoning underground scene, appearing in the 8mm experimental film Dirt and briefly becoming a hanger-on to Andy Warhol during the early days of The Factory. In 1968, two boys playing in a crumbling Greenwich Village tenement, eerily similar to the one depicted in the window, discovered a young man dead in the rubble. The body was processed by the coroner, but no one came forward to ID the corpse or claim it. It was buried on New York's Hart Island, known as Potter's Field, along with thousands of other sorry citizens who died anonymous or broke. It wasn't until a year later that a match of fingerprints identified the 31-year-old John Doe as former child star and Oscar winner Bobby Driscoll. Sorry to end on such a down note, but that's how it goes in noir, where real-life tragedy often bleeds into the movies. If you need to commiserate, do it on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. The suspense continues next week when we hop a steamer for the Gulf and end up in New Orleans for the atmospheric thriller Johnny Angel, starring George Raft and Claire Trevor. Until then, remember, if you're doing something even a little bit sketchy, pull the shades all the way down. Mm.